Okay. Alrighty, friends. So I am here to talk about uh, rich schools and poor schools. Is how I've titled my talk after a um, 1968 book. It's a very brief exploration of inequity in California school funding. So if we go back 200 years to uh, colonial and early um, United States history, um, schools were locally funded, um, often by voluntary contributions or property tax from the homeowners, taxpayers within the districts that they were located. Um, starting in the 1830s, Horace Mann, the uh, Secretary of Education in Massachusetts, did a big uh, push for common schools, which he intended to be um, schools that could educate every student in Massachusetts in an equal and equitable way. Um, a parallel thread of history, obviously we had um, the history of enslaved people in the United States. In 1868, following the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was passed um, and ratified that mentioned or, or was founded on this idea of the equal protection of the law. So 100 years later, 1968, um, an educational researcher named Arthur Wise wrote a book called Rich Schools, Poor Schools, in which he argued that unequal educational funding was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And following that, people in many states, the first here in California, um, brought challenges to educational funding formulas based on the 14th Amendment. So in California, our case is called Serrano v. Priest. John Serrano, um, a parent in Baldwin Park um, in East LA, brought a suit that said, hey, Beverly Hills gets twice the funding that we do per student, and that's inequitable and unfair. Um, and they based that on equal protection grounds. Um, the California Supreme Court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs and said, yes, under the California Constitution, education is a fundamental right. It's an important phrase. And therefore, the school funding based on local property taxes is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. However, a similar case in Texas went to the US Supreme Court. And the US Supreme Court said, nope, under the United States Constitution, education is not a fundamental right, and Texas system does not violate the Equal Protection Clause. So there were lots of aftershocks of all of this, obviously. Um, California came up with something called the Serrano Revenue Bans to try to equalize funding throughout um, California schools. There was a couple more Serrano court cases, and then Rodriguez, um, the US case, had obviously profound effects in other states. 1978, Prop 13 was passed the taxpayer revolt. And um, in one tax year, the amount of funding that was coming into the state from local property taxes, for schools in particular, um, went from up here to down here. Um, so we started the 70s with 60% um, of funding being local, and toward the end of the 70s, it was down to 20%. Today, that's still roughly the case. Um, the state actually, as of 2018, funds about 60% of public schools, Local property taxes, about another 20%. Um, and there's some other categories, federal, et cetera. This category called other local is what I want to focus on next. Um, starting in the 1980s, parents and communities saw that, hey, there's all this property tax money that we used to collect is not going to our schools anymore. So communities founded um, what's called local education foundations. Basically, anytime you've seen donate to your kid's school or box tops for schools, all of that is for um, privately donated money that goes to schools. Where do those dollars go? Um, there's a little pie chart here. You, my presentation I can share, et cetera, but um, computers and technology, sports, libraries, arts and music, science enrichment. Um, you can see just two districts. I just chose at random. Palo Alto, 6.1 million, so about $500 per student per year. East side, about $5.82 per student per year in donated funds. Some terms to know. Um, Following 2014, we have something called the local control funding formula. It basically means the state gives a, bla a base grant and then there's some additional money based on students with quote unquote high needs. There are some districts in California that are referred to as basic aid districts. It sounds like that means they're the poorest, they're actually not. They're the, the districts that can fund their educational programs entirely with local property taxes. So either very big districts with few students or very wealthy districts. The other type, the opposite of basic aid, is called revenue limit districts. So those are districts where their local property taxes don't fund all their educational property or educational programs, and they need additional funding from the state to make up to that revenue limit. Um, so what this all means, ultimately, is that Palo Alto Unified School District, um, approximately 10% of their students are economically disadvantaged, can spend about $21,000 per student per year 
east side about 12,000 per student per year. Um, and that's as of um, eddata.org has a whole thing. You can see like spreadsheets and charts of um, all of these district funding formulas. That was my talk. And I have to say, I have like, there's probably twice as many articles that I referred to as I was researching. So this is just kind of the ones I found like the most impactful. Um, yeah. Question? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Um, can I just go this way? So Mel starts off. Oh, okay. Um, so the Prop 13 the thing that's on the ballot this year is trying to talk about this or simply just bump it? Do you mind commenting on it? Yeah, so I haven't actually, I know it's on the ballot. I haven't actually looked at what exactly it's going to do. Um, what Prop 13 originally did is say property taxes are capped because before like property tax rates varied wildly all over the state. So Prop 13 said we're capping property tax at 1% of the home's assessed value. The assessment happens when the house is bought or sold. And the value of that home can only like mathematically increase by 2% over time. So even if property rates, property values are actually skyrocketing, <coughs> um, and there's some volatility in California's housing market, obviously, um, that was to try to make sure that somebody who bought their home, as my grandparents did for $29,500 in 1965, <laughs> Um, and sold it for 650000 in 2004, wasn't like handicapped by these excessive property taxes. That was the intent. Um, I would say, I'm on the fence about what, so let me say like, I think these are thorny moral issues. If you had talked to me 10 years ago, I would have said, every single person should be contributing as much as they possibly can to education. This is the, like, I don't understand why wealthy parents are not like donating all their money to kids in poor schools. Now I'm a little more like, well, I get it. Like if only if you only have enough to donate to one school and your kids are going to a school that doesn't have a music program and you really want them to have music in school, I, I don't know. Um, I think there are folks who will be, you know, forced to relocate potentially if they if their property taxes go up significantly. I don't know what kind of shelters are happening. Um, from My that. understanding is that this prop thing that's currently on the bill is just a fine business. And it was directly relevant to education from what I read, so that's why I was oh, kind of interesting. curious. Okay. So it tips this balance a little bit. It okay, then... Creating property tax for education. Then I'm not current wrong. on what the... Um, I could be wrong. I thought it was... But then it, <laughs> I'm not current on what the plan was, because I was hearing a couple years ago that they were trying to, like, reform it for mm -hmm. everyone, like mm -hmm. every property owner. So yeah. I'll walk all of that back. Yeah, we need to... Anyway, thorny moral issues. Complicated. Okay. Complicated. Yeah, Preston. Uh, I've sometimes heard the, the um, quote that America spends more money per head uh, on students and gets a lot less benefit for it. You talk about the, uh, the point of diminishing returns or um, how oh, some other countries uh, make money go further, have basically get more benefit from less money. Um, I mean, that's really interesting, I think, because... And this is so great because I'm getting questions that I like totally did not research at all. Truly. <laughs> um, I guess my opinion as like a semi-informed <coughs> education watcher and like someone who has passionate political views around this is, for instance, like Finland is often held up as a model of like, oh, America, why can't we be like Finland? And I would say, well, Finland has a relatively homogeneous um, population, both in terms of like linguistic, cultural, um, and economic status, right? So I think the, the fact that the United States has relatively few social safety nets um, outside of schools, the fact that we tolerate like extremely segregated neighborhoods, um, the fact that, you know, folks don't have health care, don't have like all of those things that we don't provide other than through the education system, I think impact the education system hugely. So um, one of the reasons, um, if I can just go back to this one, one of the reasons that they came up with this plan is they recognize that if you have a student with high needs, and I, I would, they, this is their official definition of what that means, um, English language learner, foster youth, or quote unquote economically disadvantaged, I would add to that like, adverse childhood events and trauma. Um, I would add to that, you know, <laughs> the effects of racism. Like, I would add a lot of things to that. Do they measure those things at all? 
That I don't know. Um, so yeah, I think I think the the unequal and like kind of like frankly cruel society that we have here is quite different from most other Western democracies, and that may be why. Like we're pouring money into schools that we're not pouring into children's health, nutrition, prenatal care, like all these other things that other societies are putting funds into. Um, yeah, that's my thought on that. Yeah, it's hard to um, tell which of this funding goes to computers and which goes to school lunches, right? Well, <laughs> right, and so one of the things here is that the reason it's called the local control funding formula is the idea is the state looks at your district and says, okay, you need the base grant, then we're gonna count all of your um, students with high needs and we're gonna add on like a 20% bonus for them and then if you're a district that has 55 percent or more of students with high needs we're going to add on another like half of your base grant on top of that and then from there the district says cool we're going to put that money into whatever we locally think is important um, there's some controversy over whether districts actually are putting that money towards students with high needs or whether it's going to you know the ones like there's ugh, Intra-district and inter-district inequality is like two very different buckets of problems. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a long digression. <laughs> one, one more question? I think Jamie had one. I already sort of got talked about it. Somebody else cool. has Cool, okay. Chris. Oh, I was going to guess that the places where, where schools do better pay their teachers more. Hmm. Any guesses on that? I mean, there, so there's a lot there, there's a lot going on there. I mean, my theory, um, and one of the things that's like fascinating about this whole like um, like local education foundations thing is it's kind of dark money to an extent. Like, there's not a whole lot of tracking of how that money is spent. Um, but I think you know if you're a district, if you're a school in Palo Alto, and you have your share of six point one million dollars to play with. You can spend that money on one-to-one -one laptops and then not have to spend any of your state or your basic aid funding, like your, your property tax funding on that, and therefore you can offer more to teachers, which makes you a more desirable place to teach. Also true because you probably have fewer students who come in with trauma who are not academically ready, who have like other types of special needs. So you're kind of like, you can be much more selective about who you Hire, you can hire mid career or late career professionals versus like the schools in East Side are hiring like first year teachers who you know burn out really quickly. Like, I think there's just a lot of interconnected layers of why. Um, Highest paid yeah. district in the state in the state is Mountain View, and I'm not sure it corresponds. That's that is true, yeah. and um, I'm not sure it corresponds to the most successful students in the state. <laughs> I would say, I mean, I'm guessing Palo, I'm guessing Palo Alto scores are beating Mountain View scores, so high paid teachers is a good thing in my estimation. I mean, yeah, and there's also so much like. I think every perspective that you could take on these numbers and this data is like there's a no, there's a counter <laughs> argument to it, or you could you could come back and say well, but and so you know I've heard like well, our district really spending money efficiently. That's kind of the more like conservative argument is like why should we give them money when they're just like throwing it out the window? Versus then there's I think like other folks who are like well, but kids need have greater needs. Um, <laughs> There's also a whole school of thought that says, actually, it doesn't matter how much we fund schools because what's really important is the family with a capital F. Um, and there's been some like very prominent across the political spectrum um, thinkers who have said it really matters if there's parent support. So, I mean, who knows? It's uh, complicated. Thank you. Thank you.